Hello, welcome to episode 93 of the Epic Film Challenge 2, 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, continuing on the series within a series covering all the four Dracula films in the book itself, Nosferatu, from 1922. Nosferatu, a symphony of horror, directed by F.W. Murnau, a German silent film, and kind of the first real Dracula film in feature-length form, but one that didn't quite have the rights to make. Uh, this film from the Bram Stoker novel. So what they did with this film was they they, they took the story, they took the characters, um, but they changed the names. <laughs> That'll do it. Uh, you wouldn't get away with that these days, you know, and, and it, it's a sign of the times, obviously, and, and copyright and things were a little bit different back then in terms of uh, films and adaptations, I suppose, but still they had to change the names. So we have Dracula, we have Jonathan Harker, we have Mina, but they're now named Count Orlok, Hutter, and Ellen. But the story is pretty much exactly the same. The film opens with this guy Hutter who is sent off to meet this Count Orlock and sell him a house opposite his. Um, and uh, his boss I guess is a guy called Nock who looks like a Dracula figure himself. He looks really wild and his performance right from the get-go is creepy and just like over the top. Uh, and he's a character who I kind of have a bit of a problem with in this film, I have to say, this character of Nock, um, but we'll get to that later. So the basic story follows, you know, Hutter goes off and meets the, the one and only Dracula slash Count Orlok slash Nosferatu to try and sell him this, uh, this house back home. And we are introduced to uh, Count Orlok, as played by the one and only Max Schreck, who uh, Batman fans uh, will kind of recognize that name if they don't know the actor himself, because Tim Burton uh, obviously uh, is a fan of this film and uh, named Christopher Walken's character in Batman Returns after the actor himself. So the character in Batman Returns is called Max Schreck. Anyway, so Max Schreck, he has a very um, weird uh, look to him, and uh, Connie watched some of it with me. She's seen it all before, but she didn't really want to watch it again. Uh, she watched bits of it. Um, and she had good things to say about it. She had bad things to say about it. Her, her kind of criticism of Nosferatu is that he looks like he's scared himself, you know. Uh, and he just looks like a, like a little rat face, you know. And he does. It's a weird look. It really is. And she said, I hope that that nose is prosthetic. Um, I don't really know what Max Shrek really looks like under all that makeup. So I don't know how much... The makeup augmented that, but either way, he's a weird looking dude and he really pulls off this weird performance with the character and one that I think is very effective and you've got to imagine, at the time, uh, this must have scared people. This must have given people the willies back in 1922. Um, it, it really is a creepy film and it has an, an uncomfortable feeling to it um, at times. Look at Dracula's castle, I keep saying going to Dracula, but look at Count Orlok's castle. It, it, it doesn't have the grandeur of, say, the, the 30s version, even though that is a creepy kind of location too, but there's, there's something a bit more gritty and realistic about this, because they obviously filmed it at some kind of old building, you know, and it doesn't quite look like a real castle, but it's it feels a bit more real, and because of that it's a bit more creepy, I think, I don't know. So I think that this film definitely has the creep factor over the 1930s version of Dracula. Um, and, you know, we're not going to get into comparing all four of these films, but uh, that jumps to mind. And I do think of the Lugosi Dracula and the, the Max Shrek Dra Dracula or Nosferatu um, and compare them because they are released within 10 years of each other, you know. Whereas you go to Christopher Lee's Dracula, that's like another 30 years onwards or whatever, 40, 45, not 40, what am I talking about? 20, 25 years after... Um, no, oh, yeah. How long is it? It's 1931 to 19. It's almost 30 years, right? And then you know, uh, and then we go another 20 years to the Herzog version. So th there's more of a gap there, and I just feel like that the Nosferatu and Dracula 31 are very closely linked because they're they're two very different takes on a story that is very similar, uh, done in different countries with different actors, and and has a very different feel to it. One is sound, one is silent, you know. Uh, and I always just compare them. But anyway. The film itself, uh, you know, Max Shrek I think is great as, as Count Orlok and as Nosferatu and does a great job of, of moving very creepily and moving in a very unnatural way, you know, he's very thin and kind of just waif-like and so he, he kind of like shrinks himself even more as he's walking and the, the way he walks, very slow, methodical, um, but with intent. And so it is creepy. I don't think it's quite scary, and I think that there's definitely a chance of modern, audience, modern audiences watching Nosferatu and just finding it laughable. There is definitely that uh, that danger, I think. Um, but I, you know, 
This is seen as one of the great films, and F.W. Murnau was one of the great silent directors. In fact, I would put Murnau up there with, with the best directors of all time. And certainly, if you just look at the silent era, he's up there at the very top of the list. Um, he has made some incredible films, some of which are in the book, some of which aren't in the book. Uh, and this is like seen as one of his best. It's not my favourite. Um, I have to say that now. I, I don't love it. Um, I appreciate it. I think it's a great film. What I really liked about it was the pacing. I think the pacing is so ahead of its time for 1922. Uh, and again, I'll always say that. You should never say that this is the first film to do something because there's invariably a film before that has already done it as well and maybe even better. But it feels like a really good early example of pacing done well in terms of multiple storylines because all the characters get split up, you know. Uh, about halfway through the film, we have Count Orlok going off to, you know, in, in his coffins filled with the earth that he was buried, and all those details are in this film, and they're conveyed through this book that has the, the kind of the lore of Nosferatu, various characters read it, and so the audience, us, we get to kind of read it too, and, uh, and kind of get all the details, you know, like the biting and the uh, not being able to be out in the sun and the being buried in the, uh, the earth on a uh, sleeping in the earth that, the, that Dracula was buried in to, to keep himself, you know, alive and things like that, even though he's dead, I don't know. Uh, so it has all those details, and I like that. I like that it gave you all that information, um, and like some other Dracula films, perhaps they don't leave it as vague, you get to kind of eventually find out. And I like how uh, when uh, Hutter, the Jonathan Harker of this film, he, he wakes up one morning and he's got these two bite marks on his neck. Uh, he doesn't take it too seriously, and you're thinking, well, surely he'd think it's a bit more serious, a bit serious if he saw some bite marks on his neck. But then he, but then you go and see him go outside, and the sun is out, and he's smiling, and he's writing a letter to his girlfriend, and he mentions it, and we see the page on the screen, and he says, "Yeah, I think a mosquito got to me or something." And I like that because it, it, it tied into, you know, what's he thinking? Well, you get to see through the letter, you know, and the, it's the modes of telling stories with the limitations of silent film that really interest me when when they're presented in a way that's like, oh, that's a good way of getting across that part of the story, you know, without having him turn to someone and say, hey, I think this is a mosquito bite on my neck, and then you see that on the screen. You see the letter he's writing, and this is something that's used a lot in silent films, is um, close-ups of letters, um, notes, things like that, books, to convey information to the audience, and uh, it does it very well in this one, I think. Um, and the pacing. We have Count Orlok going off, we have Hutter trying to get back home, we have uh, Ellen worrying about him, and then we even get this other mini side story of this scientist who's showing his students this Venus flytrap and he's talking about how it works. And it's kind of like a, uh, it's, it's doubling kind of, you know, what he's saying is about this Venus flytrap and these kind of um, predatory like uh, plants and things, but it's, re it's also applying to what Count Orlok is, you know, preying on things and, uh, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and I put it quite badly there, but it's 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 kind of done better in the film. And so we cut back to that, and then we cut back to Nock, you know, the guy from the beginning. And, and Nock's character just did very little for me. He just seems to wait around in a jail cell saying, the master is coming, the master is coming. And I'm wondering, how is he linked with Orlok? You know, did he previously meet him? I guess that's what we have to assume is that, uh, that Nock had a previous encounter with, with Orlok, and that's why he's so wild and manic from the get-go and then he goes on a rampage towards the end of the film and then they apprehend him and I just didn't feel like his storyline really went anywhere or advanced the plot that much at all. Uh, my favorite part of the film was probably um, the scenes where Orlok was traveling across the sea. It felt a bit like a pirate movie with the big ship and everything and I really loved it. There's a good shot of um, the camera just panning towards the boat as it's like going across the ocean and I really like that shot. I mean, it's nothing, you know, revolutionary or anything, but just the fact that Murnau said, right, let's not just put a camera on shore and film the boat and make it seem like it's out of ocean. Let's put a camera on the front of another boat and move it towards it as it's going so we get this this motion in the shot. You know, just the way that he, he puts things together is really, really well done, especially towards the end when we see Nosferatu finally make his, his, last, his last prey. You know, he goes up to try and... Uh, to try and get to Ellen, and we see his shadow. That's all we see, creepily advancing across the wall. And it's one of the great shots of silent cinema. And uh, it, it's just a beautifully kind of uh, composed shot, and it just is really creepy, you know. I think if anyone sees that, they, they know what it is. You know, that's got to be Dracula. You know, that, oh, that's a vampire, you know. Just the way it moves. And, uh, yeah, visually, I think. And, and the pacing, like I said, it cuts between these different storylines, and it feels very... Um, uh, flowy? I don't know, it feels natural, it doesn't feel um, too complicated, it doesn't feel like it's cutting between too much, that we don't, we're losing what's going on. I didn't feel that much, but I have to say, 
despite all that, despite all the things that I like about this film, all the things I respect about this film, all the things that I think that this is a really well-constructed film for its time, um, I, I don't really love it. Uh, in fact, both times that I've seen it now, it's, it's been a bit of a slog to get through. And it's not for lack of, of um, uh, quality, I don't feel. I don't know what it is about me that doesn't quite connect to it in a way that I, I wish that I would, you know. Uh, there's great moments in it, great scenes in it. I think it's a really, really good horror film and it's, it's a classic. And it, uh, you know, it deserves its place in film history, you know. A lot of people would, would call this a, mas a masterpiece. And I suppose in many ways it is, but I don't really enjoy it as a masterpiece, if that makes sense. There's just something about it that doesn't really click with me uh, from start to finish. You know, my mind starts to wander, and I'll pause it, and I, I hate doing that, but I just, yeah, it just, it was a slog. I don't know why, it just was. And uh, for anyone new to the channel, that is not me not being accustomed to silent films. I've seen over 100 silent films now, and uh, I have no problem sitting through a three-hour silent film if it engages me, and it just doesn't seem to fully engage me. And another thing I think that kind of goes with that, it puts me out of it a little bit, is the fact that uh, a lot of times you see Nosferatu walking around in, in bright sunlight. You know, you can see the, the, tr the shadow of the trees on the floor. It's clearly filmed in the middle of the day, uh, even though it's, it's a scene that's supposed to take place at night. Um, and they do play with tinting, you know, the, the color tinting and the timing with, you know, the light goes out and it'll go blue to show that it's night. And, you know, it's kind of the, the, the classic kind of textbook silent movie um, effect. But sometimes they wouldn't do that. Uh, and you can just see that the actor is walking walking through the sunlight and it's like oh he should be dead there really but I guess we're supposed to think that it's at night and not in the middle of the day I don't know I think they could have done something with they could have just you know rent a few lights or something and, and, and film it at night I don't know uh, obviously limitations uh, had to have been in effect there because Murnau was a great filmmaker and there has to have been a, a really good reason for why he couldn't pull those scenes off perhaps the way he would have wanted I don't know there are some really <clears throat> excuse me, creepy f that moments as I said and I think the creepiest is probably when Nosferatu does move in to this house opposite um, Hutter and Ellen and she keeps seeing him at night every, every, you know, every night she sees him just looking at her from the window just like that and, and, and you don't, well you do get a close up of it but the first time you see it you just see like just the head just, well just the, you know, you just vaguely see the figure of him just in the top window and that, that is, that's one of the things that really scares me uh, not in the film, but in real life. If I was to walk past a, this old creepy building and there was just one person in like the top window just looking down at me, that would scare the living shit out of me. That's one of those things that is, is part of my fears, is just seeing someone in a window like that in a dark house. That's, that's one of the creepy images for me. And it pulls it off really well in this film. So Nosferatu, is it a film you must see before you die? Yes, it is. It is. Um, even if I don't get fully engaged by it, even if I don't fully enjoy it as much as I would like to because I love Murnau and I, and I think it is a genuinely great film and it is done really well. The story is told well. I do think the knock stuff is a bit arbitrary and could have, it could have been cut out of the film or his, his, his role should have been diminished because I don't feel like he added much and his storyline just, for me, just, just le seeks to lengthen the plot. Uh, lengthen the, the running time, sorry. And uh, I, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, I like how the, the Black Plague, the play kind of played into the film as well. There's lots of great things about it. And people should definitely watch it because it's, it's a great early horror film and it definitely deserves its place to be talked about as one of those great films. But it's one that I don't personally love that much. But it's still a film you must see before you die. So join me tomorrow uh, in the next video for the final Dracula review where I'll be talking about a remake of this film from 1979, Nosferatu, directed by Werner Herzog and starring at Klaus Kinski. I can't wait to check it out. I haven't seen it yet. And yeah, uh, it'll be an interesting way to close out this little kind of mini series of Dracula reviews as we continue on with Horror Month, October 2016. Hope you're enjoying the reviews so far. I'm really enjoying doing them and getting them out and commenting with you guys about all these films. And I'll see you with the next one.